Okay, so hello everybody. I am Mike once again, uh, bringing to you a lecture that I'm gonna do kind of for fun. Uh, this time I'm gonna do a book that I absolutely love. Um, I think everyone should read it, whether you're white or black or brown or Martian, especially white. Although let's keep in mind that uh, black intellectual thought had these had all these ideas way before this book. Um, however, this book uh, personally means a lot to me and it was extremely important in the field of linguistic anthropology. Uh, it's this one by a linguistic anthropologist named uh, Jane Hill. Uh, it's just so useful. I definitely recommend it for uh, grad level classes, but also I think with this video, I'm pretty sure you can get away with teaching this to undergrads, um, but we'll see. We'll try it out. Um, so this is gonna help us understand why stuff like Trump talk is so offensive. Uh, so we feel it, but we're not quite sure how to explain um, why it's offensive, other than by saying, oh, that's racist. Uh, so let's keep in mind uh, who we are as readers when we pick up this book. So I identify as Mexican American. Um, I'm reading this book through my own life experience. Uh, also, this is uh, a book from 10 years ago. Um, so all of this affects my interpretation. It also affects on what examples I pull from, as I'm most comfortable talking about racist speech when it comes to the category Mexican, uh, because I can better predict what my community, a very specific community in Texas, I can predict what uh, those people would agree is racist. Uh, but I don't speak on behalf of the giant category known as Mexican or the giant category known as Latino. Um, so let's look at the first chapter of this book. So it's called The Persistence of White Racism. Uh, this is going to require us to think deeply about what we believe. So going to page five, she talks about folk theories of race. Uh, she gives us two really powerful folk theories of race. So to begin, let's talk about that, that term, uh, folk theory. So folk meaning something like being of the folk or would mean something like of the people so folk theory common knowledge people knowledge uh, the second word though theory is a bit more interesting to me now theory implies something that could potentially be rationalized uh, things learned about things theorized about now when i say rationalized, i don't mean to imply that they're actually rational I'm just saying that something is made to make sense. So, folk theory, right off the bat, we are not talking about uh, ignorant babble from white supremacists. Uh, we're talking about something that requires a great deal of presupposed knowledge and life experience. Not just a couple of learnt facts, but deeply ing ingrained knowledge that we think of as true because we have heard it all our lives. Okay, so the first folk theory. Race is a basic category of human biology. Race is biologically real. Now there are many things that help produce this perception, but I'm going to I'm going to give you one example. Just one sentence. One statistic. 12.1% of adult Hispanics have diabetes. So this is tricky. Our eyes are drawn to the objective numbers, the scientific numbers, 12.1. Also the disease and the health problem, diabetes. But very simply, this sentence presupposes that Hispanics exist. The statement presupposes that you know what a Hispanic is, it tells you that Hispanics exist while also presupposing the existence of Hispanics as an objective, uh, even cons on an objective and even concerned biological ground. 
Now, I'm not saying this statement is racist. What I'm saying is statements like this hold a lot more information than what we see, than uh, what we're conscious of. In actuality, biologists and geneticists um, pretty much agree that race categories are a socio-political phenomenon. Race categories basically have no utility in terms of genetics. Now, the second folk theory holds that racism exists in and through people's individual beliefs, intentions, and actions. Meaning, racism looks and sounds like a KKK member. Uh, it is the explicit belief of biological inferiority. Now, granted, there is a resurgence of overt white supremacists uh, today, but what Jane Hill is saying is that racism and racist power reproduces itself and lurks in places that are not so obvious. That's where most of the racism is today. And the third major folk theory of race is that people people prefer to be with their own kind. So people prefer to be with their own kind. First, what is presupposed in this sentence? That kinds exist, that race is, exists. But let's dig a little deeper. How is this not true? So I'm Mexican. I like to be with people that talk like me, that get my jokes. And that feels pretty natural to me. But is it natural? Now, the place that I grew up is surrounded by, bo by border patrol checkpoints to the north and to the south. Meaning my Mexican community, the towns and cities that I grew up in, the older generations didn't leave this area. To this day, undocumented people do not leave this area. Maybe the reason that I like to be around Mexicans is because of the political conditions that forced me to be around Mexicans all the time. Literally being socialized from birth into my community. That made me feel comfortable. That's why I like hanging out with Mexicans. That's not nature. That's politics. And racist politics at that. That's not self-segregation. That is a set of political conditions that makes segregation more and more likely. Now, on page 20, Hill reviews what she believes are the major projects of white racism. The first is to produce a taxonomy of races, meaning identifiable, discrete, separable races. For example, the census. As a form of objective knowledge used in calculating mathematical statistics, this works as proof, or at least it's an example, that race exists. It looks objective. Yet when we look at these race categories throughout history in the census itself, they change radically. Um, not even something as allegedly objective as something like a census knows what race is. The second project is the assignment of individuals to these categories through processes of racialization, which we'll talk about more. But for now, let's just say racialization is the process of assigning race to someone. Um, this happens explicitly, like in the census, or it happens unconsciously in a split second, like perceiving someone as being part of a race category, like, oh yeah, that person's probably black, that person's probably Latino, whatever. Third, um, third is the, is the project of arrangement into hierarchy or ways that we decide whose values are the most important. And last, the moving of resources, material and symbolic. 
here she goes into uh, pretty great detail into uh, residential segregation um, in this chapter. So that's a, a pretty explicit explanation of what she means by material resources being reallocated or moved around or rearranged. Now lastly, for this first video, I want to talk about the match guys test from page 12. So a quick overview of what this was. Um, so a white woman was recorded giving a lecture, speaking in standard or a white form of English. Now, using two groups of white college students, uh, one was giving the picture of a white woman and told that this was the speaker. The other was given a picture of an East Asian woman and told this was the speaker. The students with the East Asian woman picture uh, reported that the voice that was recorded, the voice that they heard, had a foreign accent. Not only that, they scored significantly worse on the follow-up test about the lecture. So this is to highlight the point that race is perceived multimodally, meaning through vision and through sound, through the voice. Uh, this might be an explicit example of racialization, the adding or the in inputting of race into and through the body. In this case, the voice. The voice was racialized when paired with a picture. Even though there was no accent, race was heard. Race was injected. Um, so this is a tiny bit of proof that even when racial racialized populations uh, speak forms of white English perfectly, uh, they're still perceived as speaking incorrectly. So the idea that if a racialized group just learned English better, uh, they would have access to better jobs and whatnot. Absolutely false. Race is seen through the eyes. Race is heard. Race is perceived in ways racialized populations have no control over. It is not our choice. It's the listener who decides a lot of the times. Now to use a more contemporary example. Uh, remember that movie with Will Smith, Independence Day. So Will Smith himself controls a variety of registers of English, including white English. Uh, now remember when he punches an alien in the face, an alien face, and says, welcome to Earth, right? So this produced a meme. I personally didn't remember him saying, welcome to Earth. So I went back and I listened. Um, I don't hear Earth, but if I really, really try, I can hear Earth. Interesting. Now, just a quick shout out to Jonathan Rosa at Stanford, who uses this example. Go look up his stuff. It's really, it's really, really good shit. Um, so we hear, we hear race, we see race, but also let's not forget that we read race. We read race, even in texts. You hear earth and you racialize the text when you imagine these words coming from a racialized group or a racialized body. Okay, so that's it for this video. On to the next chapter, which is a little bit more difficult, but I'm gonna break it down for you in easier language with easy examples from today. Maybe not as old as Independence Day anymore, but uh, I'm gonna make this easy for you guys. So once again, I am Mike, and I will see you for part two and the next chapter of the everyday language of white racism.